Hello, and welcome to SLW Institute's International IP Webinar Series. My name is Greg Stark, and I am a principal with Schwegman, Lundberg, and Wissner. Today's webinar, Global Patent Drafting and Filing Strategies, will be presented by my colleague, Dr. John Collins. Dr. Collins is a UK and European patent and trademark attorney based in the UK office of Schwegman, Lundberg, and Wissner. John has considerable experience in proceedings before the European Patent Office, including oppositions and appeals. He also has litigation experience in both the UK and the US. Based on over a decade of working with John, I can attest to his experience, expertise, and depth of knowledge regarding the subject matter of today's webinar. To submit questions today, please feel free to use the Q&A feature on the webinar menu, and John will address them at the end of the formal presentation. Thank you for joining us. And with that, I'll hand things over to John. Thanks, Craig. So uh, what I'd like to talk about today is uh, the set of very grand topic, global patent drafting. Uh, and here's an outline of what I'd like to talk about. Obviously, I'm viewing this from a, as a, a European attorney, but I've got a great deal of experience in operating within the US um, and internationally. And uh, what is very evident is despite the efforts of the authorities, there is significant international di diversification on key principles of uh, patent uh, enforcement and indeed prosecution. So we'll take a look at those. We'll then take a look at uh, some drafting considerations for, for some key countries. So I picked Japan as an example. Uh, US and Europe are the two key focuses um, uh, I, I want to concentrate on. Japan's thrown in there as well. Then take a look at uh, a proposed uh, global patent application, some of the issues that need to be considered. Throw into that uh, my particular field of expertise is software, so let's take a look at some considerations for software and business methods. And then following on from understanding how to draft the international patent, how to make it best fit for purpose, let's talk about how to use it, and global patent filing strategies and last of all, just a little bit of a warning as US patent attorneys, there are some traps that uh, you can fall into. So I wanted to address some of those uh, and point out some of the issues that they can cause. So let's move right on in to consider international diversification. The substantive law on, on claim requirements and interpretation is different in different countries. There are subtle differences, but often quite substantive differences. And the impact on the requirements for the content, the drawing, this description, and abstract is um, varied. There are many competing requirements and a compromise is required in order to ensure that when you draft the specification, it will uh, sail through as best it can in all these countries. One of the key things I will sort of repeat and reiterate several times during this presentation is that the foreign requirements do impact at first filing, at priority date. And for US practitioners, that's quite a, quite a thorny issue. So the national drafters, so the person drafting as, a, as a, your own national expertise, whether you be a US attorney, a European attorney, Chinese attorney, you must take international requirements into account when first filing a specification. And of course, when you come to use the PCT system, that brings with it the need to think truly globally, because it is indeed truly an international patent application. So let's take a look, first of all, briefly uh, at example countries, and I picked Japan as an example here. Um, what are some considerations for drafting in Japan? When drafting the specification, headings are used uh, to define the structure of the specification. Uh, best mode is not a requirement uh, for the description, for the disclosure, but sufficiency is. Incorporation by reference, a common thing for US attorneys to use that, fall back on the subject matter. This is not allowed in Japan. It's not something you can rely on. So the, the specification must be wholly uh, uh, encompassing in its disclosure. Claim elements need not be illustrated in the drawings. I know this is a particular requirement of US practice in Japan. Uh, drawings are there only if required and useful. Um, but what's also quite important in Japan is there's no prosecution history estoppel. So when drafting, um, you're not 
worried about that future unknown time bomb uh, of what's going to happen later on. Um, means plus function claims, uh, they are not limited. They are commonly used in Japan. We don't have a problem with interpretation of those in, the, in Japan. Multiply dependent claims are allowed. Uh, there's no restriction on the way in which claim dependency is structured. Uh, claims fees, uh, you only pay for the claims which um, are numbered and not on their dependency, not on their structure. A limited number of independent claims are allowed in each category. So uh, you have some degree of freedom with regard to your drafting of your claims into uh, particular independent uh, pigeonholes. So let's take a look at the US. This should be, of course, home territory for many of the uh, listeners. Headings that are required, that's fine. Structures the specification, best mode and sufficiency required. Incorporation by reference is allowed and indeed very useful um, within the US practice framework. Claim elements must be illustrated in drawing. So again, uh, good practice to ensure, of course, that uh, for all of the claims, there are effectively picture um, uh, pictures of those claims, particularly for uh, flow diagram method type claims. Prosecution uh, history estoppel. This is, uh, of course, a big thorn for, for US practice and something to be wary of. And uh, references to related applications. That's another peculiarity of US practice to require uh, the reference to the previous priority claims and earlier filed applications on which you are relying for the, uh, for the US uh, full utility application. Uh, means for function claims, again, you'll notice a common theme here on comparing element by element. Means for function claims are, of course, allowed. Uh, they have a limitation in the US Code uh, Section 112. Um, uh, historically, it's funny how means for function claims have ebbed and waned, ebbed, flowed, changed direction over the years. They currently seem to be a flavor that's somewhat in under Alice, but I'm not going to go into great details there. Uh, they, they are available, but you have to be very careful with them. Multiply dependent claims are allowed, um, but not if multiply dependent, but then you're paying fees dependent upon the claim dependency, not simply on the claim numbers that you have, and that can be expensive. A large number of claims uh, are generally a good idea. Your litigation team will be telling you as many claims as possible, please, lots of independent claims. However, uh, the USPTO have placed quite a considerable restraint on that, a constraint by way of claims fees. Uh, and therefore, most applications these days fall towards 20, uh, 20 claims and three independents, simply for financial reasons. Um, relatively broad scope for amendment after filing. This is quite an important thought, uh, which I've put a placeholder here for, because when you're drafting an application in the US, um, you are later able to have quite a degree of freedom in the way in which you amend the specification compared to other countries, and particularly Europe. That's one of our biggest problem areas. So let's, mentioning Europe, let's move on into Europe and have a look at those same considerations, see how they line up. Uh, headings are not required in Europe for the specification, but they're not a bad idea. We we'll tend to use them. They help structure the specification into uh, the summary the um, embodiments, etc., brief description of drawings. The best mode is not required in Europe, but sufficiency is required. Um, you do have to describe an embodiment and the scope, a number of embodiments potentially, uh, with the, which support the scope of the claims. Incorporation by reference is not allowed. I say not allowed, I'm being pretty harsh. In theory, it is allowed. But in practice, uh, the restraints on the way in which you can use it are so, so narrow uh, that it is, in all real effect, useless. So you can't rely on putting through material from other applications into your specification. You need to ensure the specification is complete if, if you want to rely on claim subject matter. Um, and if, because of best mode requirements, you don't need it to support best mode. Um, the claim elements need not be illustrated in the drawing, so there's no real problem with that. 
and we have no prosecution history estoppel. And indeed, um, I think for many US practitioners, the habit we have in Europe uh, in order to argue for inventive step is, is quite strange. Uh, we have to argue for um, a technical solution to a technical problem for inventive step based on the closest prior art. Uh, it is a purely an objective test, not subjective. And it will be reformulated many times depending on the closest prior art or indeed many prior art documents each individually. And therefore your arguments are purely legal and not factual and don't come back to bite you um, it by way of history estoppel, very, very limited. Um, moving on to the next point, here is the uh, amendments for, uh, sorry, the scope for making amendments after filing. This is one of the biggest problems we have. I mentioned it earlier with regard to the US. Uh, Article 123 uh, sections are very, very tough and making amendments after filing is tough. We have to find almost literal basis in the specification. The dread, dreaded words when we come to making an amendment is they must be directly and unambiguously derivable. And you would not believe what ambiguity European examiners can sometimes find with regard to the wording you wish to use, uh, preventing the amendment you want. And finally, uh, the, well, finally, another point on that slide is strict priority basis. Now, the basis for a priority claim has the same scope or that is the tested legally in the same way as added subject matter. If you have a claim um, and you want to claim that, that to reach back to claim priority, the scope of that the claim must be directly and unambiguously derivable from the priority application, from this disclosure in the priority application, not just the claims, whatever's in there, uh, the complete disclosure. So moving on, means plus function claims, um, same as Japan, these are not limited. Uh, they are commonly used, they don't cause us any problem. Uh, they are broadly interpreted, but that means of course, the prior art can be broadly brought in to um, invalidate them if they are too broad. Multiple independent claims are allowed and indeed advisable in Europe. Um, from the outset, we should try to include as many dependencies, cross dependencies as possible in the claims. You don't pay any claims fees for them. EPO, there, is, uh, there are claims fees for the 15th and every claim thereafter, and they become extremely high, 245 euros per claim, above 15, and then 610 euros if you try and go above 15, uh, 50 on 50 claims. So it is just not done. I mean, people sometimes, uh, some applicants will do, have a few claims, but rarely will anybody want to stump up thousands and thousands of euros uh, for the benefit of some extra claims. Um, European practice only allows a minimum number of independent claims in each category. That's the wording they use. And what that means generally is one method claim, one apparatus claim, uh, one, in, one independent method claim, one independent apparatus claim, no more. Um, now, a lot of European practitioners will say, oh, the EPO requires that the two-part claim form be used with a characterized in that form. Uh, this is not so. It is a preference of the European Parliament that always ask for it. And uh, in the 30 years I've been practicing, I never give it. Um, purely for estoppel reasons in the US, in case it's ever used against you, that you admitted that certain parts of the claim were in the prior art. Uh, you simply refer to the requirements of the rules that it is uh, where possible, the claim should be cast in two part form but um, clarity is, is overriding Article 84. Uh, it overrides the need for this. And so you simply say the claim becomes less clear and the EPO examiners generally give in. Um, it helps if you make the claim uh, less partitionable um, so that you don't include an easily divisible claim because if you do, then you probably get a notice of allowance, the rule 713 with the words characterized in that put in by the examiner. Um, so that's another sort of sneaky drafting tip is avoid the claim being divisible when you're amending uh, to avoid the two-part form. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, reference numerals, that's another one. Uh, reference numerals are required in the claims. They are required in the claims of the EPO, um, but they're only required for the EPO 
and they are not limited, uh, they, sorry, they don't limit the scope of interpretation of the claims. They are there to guide uh, reading and um, nothing more. Um, so moving on to tips for reducing dependencies in Europe. This is specific to Europe, but um, uh, it's to be considered when you're drafting uh, a specification internationally. Multiple dependencies. Um, it's important to remember that you can depend on more than one claim, any of which can itself depend on many others. So use that. Um, when it comes to claims, uh, Europe has no problem with using and or for alternatives um, and indeed combining. Uh, so we're in the processor has this function and or this function. Uh, you can certainly do that to try to, to reduce the number of claims. Uh, and this goes on to the third point there, which is listing alternatives in one claim. Um, apparatus for performing the method uh, of any of the method claims previously. Another way of nicely drawing in the scope. I use this rather a lot in software practice because it's just a processor that performs the method. And uh, generally that's a simple way of avoiding a complete set of apparatus claims. One claim will get you all of the method claims that you previously had um, effectively covered under that mixed type claim, but it is not mixed because it is uh, an apparatus claim. Uh, I'll come on to a particular software example later on. You can use the word means for performing the steps or you could refer to a processor. Only thing to be careful of is when you do actually draft claim dependencies that uh, there is consistency. Uh, you, know, you don't have a claim dependent on uh, wherein it's red um, and the second, another claim as in any previous claim wherein it's blue. Um, that's just messy. It's, it's, it's inconsistent. So just take care. No particular uh, penalty for that. Um, the examiner might pick up on it and raise clarity. So having regard to all of those points, how do we draw these uh, competing requirements together for a global patent application? Again, first point I will bang on and on and on about is you must draft uh, the uh, international specification for first filing, or if you need to file a priority application, uh, which is purely a provisional, then you need to file the full, full application as soon as possible, but before disclosure. The danger is with a very limited priority uh, disclosure that you will not have support for ba a basis for um, the priority claim, that it won't support full scope of the, the um, claim subject matter. And a self-disclosure by the applicant at a conference, for example, at a trade show, will potentially be um, therefore novelty destroying for the full scope of the claim uh, that you wish to get. And the only scope that you are entitled to claim priority to will be a very narrow example as in the priority application. So we can um, Certainly when filing a PCT application, uh, that the specification must be fully international ready um, because you cannot, uh, when entering the regional phase, such as in Europe, you can't say, oh, can you uh, file this specification, please? The PCT application is a app national application in all of those countries and in Europe. So, for example, when you enter the regional phase in Europe, you're not filing an application in Europe, you're simply paying fees and filing a form to complete certain formalities uh, to take it forward in Europe. Indeed, in Europe, for example, the European application is already issued with an application number and is entered in the register as soon as the PCT application is published. So it is the PCT application becomes immediately becomes a European application. So it's too late uh, after filing to try to change the draft. Um, so the specification must be sufficient and best mode. Of course, you need to consider the worst case scenario and the US making sure that you do meet the best mode requirements. Headings, use them. Uh, they're a good structure. US wants them, needs them. Japan needs them. Okay, in Europe, that's fine. Incorporation by reference. Now, having bearing in mind looking over your shoulder at best mode, yes, okay, use it, but beware that you cannot use it for essential material required to support the claims in many countries 
like Japan and like Europe. Um, so use incorporation by reference very carefully uh, and only where you think it might help you in the US. But remember, it's, 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 all, it's ignored effectively in other countries. Um, another one here is my favorite here is patent profanities. Um, there are certain terms that should just never, words that should just never to appear in a patent specification. Um, or at least you need to use them very carefully and knowingly. Words like essential, uh, preferable. This is commonly, it has been used historically, and I'm afraid you, you, UK practitioners, certainly uh, ones that have used this often, and some still do. Uh, if it's preferable, uh, for example, the examples of subclaims, uh, dependent claims, where, oh, it's preferably this and preferably that. I've had European examiners saying, well, if it's preferable, please put it in claim one. Uh, so beware, it's, it's a, a term that's used in a trite manner, I think, without rethinking really why uh, you're using it. Again, of course, the invention, we all know, we have to be very careful about what the invention is. The invention in European eyes is claim one, that is the invention. Uh, and if you say something is the invention, then the examiner, examiner in Europe will ask you to put it in claim one. Uh, require goes without saying. Um, aim and object. Uh, these uh, go towards uh, meeting the essential goals of the patent specification. If your claim doesn't meet that in Japan, it can be a problem. Uh, you're, it's uh, indeed even in the US, it's a bit harsh, but it can be considered inutile if not meeting the objectives. And again, in Europe, the examiner will say, but the aim, you clearly state the aim and the objective is to do this. And therefore, uh, in order to achieve that, all of those features that you've said are, embod are embodiments are actually essential. Put them in claim one, please. So be very careful about the terms you use. Uh, and these, uh, say, globally put under the term patent profanities, be careful. Um, <clears throat> yes, to meet the US requirements, yeah, include the uh, references to related applications. This does no harm. We can take it out in other countries when we don't need it, but put it in, it helps. Um, right, the, the next point here is very, very important. Just providing scope for alternative embodiments. You, you put a general, a nice broad claim in, and you want to support that you really are entitled to that scope of claim. If you simply include a very narrow embodiment underneath that, even if you have described some claims, or sorry, included dependent claims, you have no um, structure underneath the claims, apart from a very narrow disclosure, to support the scope of the claims. Ideally, you should describe a number of embodiments in detail using describing alternative components, but only once you've described an embodiment. Um, the practice in the US that has developed recently uh, over, the, over the past few years, using optional extras all the way through. Uh, in this embodiment, it may be this, it may be that. Uh, it may have uh, an input, it may have a port, it may have something. Uh, all the way through, the, the specification doesn't actually describe an embodiment. It simply describes a bucket of bricks, a bucket of Lego bricks uh, that you could build a house with and says you could use any of them, if you like, to build something. Um, the EPO uh, can get pretty uh, snarky about that and put up an objection that it's unclear. The specification doesn't include any description of an embodiment. It's simply saying it could be a lot of things, but it doesn't actually say what it is. And it's quite difficult to fix. Um, it's better to describe an embodiment and then talk about, after describing the embodiment, what the alternatives could be. That way you meet both the requirements of a clear embodiment plus intermediate positions, and you can describe generalized embodiments, generalized positions afterwards. But don't do it in amongst the description of, embodi of an embodiment itself. That becomes a real mess. <coughs> um, yes, yeah, so the next point is describing uh, the technical features of the invention. You need to describe technical features. Uh, I've already mentioned earlier on that the EPO's test for invention, an inventive step, is a technical solution to a technical problem. Now, this isn't just restricted in some way to software, where we all sort of heard this term used. It is actually used throughout, whether you have 
a new paper shuffling machine, uh, the, the examiners will still say, we'll talk about technical solution to a technical problem. And so you therefore need to describe technical features of the invention. So when you're working in software or business method inventions, as we'll discuss in more detail later, you need to ensure that you do talk about the technical nature of the technical components of the invention. Um, avoid the two-part claim form. I mentioned that earlier. It's a preference, not a requirement at uh, VPO. And don't include reference numerals. PCT, uh, even if you are going to use the EPO as the search authority, doesn't matter. It's not a requirement. These can easily be added later. This causes us no problem. It's part of our normal uh, sort of practice as European attorneys to add reference numerals later when, uh, when required. Um, means plus function claims and non means plus function claims, ideally, include them both. Now, of course, this does bring on issues of how many claims you've got. Um, you know, are you paying claims fees? Uh, what type of application are you filing? Uh, we'll come on to the strategies in a, a bit later. Um, but if you are constrained by claims fees, you can include equivalent language in the description, uh, maybe towards the end, typically, under a heading of alternative embodiments, um, and call them examples, examples or embodiments, and use numbering. So just simply cut and paste a set of claims as if they were claims, but change um, a cl the word claim to example or embodiment. And include multiply dependent, independent claims. Make sure they are multiply independent, multiply dependent um, and either use those as claims again or, or at the end of the description. Um, include general claim language. And that's means for function language. I know in the US it's a bit concerning as to whether you start using that in the description as to whether you start uh, stating you're not, or sorry, being concerned you're not describing structure for the function. But if it's at the end, even if it may not be useful in the US, it would be very useful in uh, other countries to support uh, amended claims. Beware the impact of EPO claims fees, well, indeed US claims fees as well, of course and restrictions, of, uh, restrictions on the number of independent claims. So moving on to some special considerations for software and business methods. Uh, these do create additional requirements and problems. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about each uh, of the country requirements. Japan, briefly, um, their laws defined as cre a creation of technical ideas using natural laws. Uh, inventions are allowed if achieved through the concrete use, excuse me, use, not us, of hardware resources. Um, so they must claim the interaction of hardware components. Generally, that's not too difficult. Um, and it is possible to draft most claims, uh, most uh, inventions in a claimed hardware manner by components interacting with one another. Again, if the description describes some sort of hardware structure, and we're not talking about specialist hardware, we're just simply talking about the normal components of a computer. Claims to a computer program per se are allowed, and indeed uh, there is an enhanced infringement by statute right uh, for just purely a computer program, because it is specifically mentioned in statute. Uh, claims to a storage medium allowed. They don't allow claims to a, a signal. They have not, uh, had case law bring that into effect. In the US, uh, again, I'm not going to spend long on this because we could talk for hours. Uh, of course, the old phrase, uh, old phrase saying that anything under the sun made by man is patentable, that's just not true. Alice has brought together, uh, and all the decisions following Alice has brought a huge long list of uh, non statutory type uh, case law and complex set of guidelines with a uh, multi-step test. Uh, but I think the, the, the thing I pick on most out of all of the case law of the US is really you're looking for something significantly more. And often that is aligned with the technical test in Europe. Uh, it's not totally accurate, but it does help. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So claims to storage media or non-transitory medium is allowed. You can't have claims to signals or computer programs. They are 
uh, non statutory subject matter. In Europe, we are required to define technical features of the invention and they must uh, define a technical solution to a technical problem. Uh, the test for statutory subject matter is combined into the inventive step test. Uh, there is no two part test as in the US where you decide whether the subject matter of the application is statutory and then move on to the prior art. Uh, generally, we skip through that pretty quickly as long as we have claimed something on a computer that's technical. Um, but is it doing something technical more than just being a computer? Um, the non technical features are deemed given to a skilled person with a solution to a technical problem. So all of the administrative uh, elements of the claim are ignored in the uh, solution to a technical problem. Uh, they come back to bite you, effectively. They don't help you. They, uh, are, uh, they can be likened to being put into the prior art. Maybe if you don't like that, that statement, but it's, it's equivalent to considering them as being in the prior art and used in that manner because they are deemed given to a person who has to make the invention. Uh, to see whether there's anything technical that they have to do to make the what's left of the claim subject matter. Um, software claims are allowed in any form. Uh, you can claim it as a storage medium, uh, a signal, a computer program, a uh, machine readable medium, uh, any form you like, as long as the claim either refers purely to the method claim, method uh, claims, or recites the same technical features. Uh, it, basically, the, the non statutory concept is uh, removed by the, the use of these the technical statutory uh, features elements. So some drafting tips for software. <coughs> um, the claims must define technical features, must define a technical solution to a technical problem. Uh, remembering non-technical features are going to be ignored. So to support the claims, you need to describe structure and function. You need to describe what it is and what it does. And the structure needs to be described at, at multiple levels. Unfortunately, the um, patent specifications often fail, fail because they have not gone deep enough. They are too high level, overall sweeping, just talk about the use of a computer. So clearly the computer and the way it works has no real bearing on what is happening. So ideally, the structure must define the overall system, uh, the internal computer structure, the code structure, and the data structure. There must be some, even if the code is, or the data is a list, it's a set of data, state what the data is and what's going to be passed where and how. What is the code structure? Are there modules? Are there elements? Of course, to generalize afterwards, you can say, well, though we said it was this structure, it can be structured other ways, but describe structure. When it comes to function, you've talked about the system, describe how the system functions. You've talked about the structure, computer structure, describe how that functions. And then when it's the code and data, talk about how that is moved around and shared and operates at that level. The key point here, and I put this in great big capital letters, is Detailed technical features are essential for the EPO. And I believe, you know, with the Alice issue and the difficulties in US practice, uh, the technical drafting with enough technical depth in the, uh, basically makes life in the US a lot easier following the Alice decision and indeed all of the other decisions uh, in the US. I threw up some pretty pictures. <sighs> These are going back way back. Of course, what's a computer look like? Uh, but don't just do the same picture every time, modify it. I think the only small modification I've got in this simple example down here is there's in the data store, there's a digital certificate of the program memory, this particular program code. So that you don't just simply cut and paste. Boilerplate doesn't help you. You need to integrate the description of the technology with the particular technical features of the invention. On the left-hand side, again, obviously this is a very um, business method -y. Concept, we've got bidder terminals, seller terminals. So this is some sort of bidding selling system, auction processor, but it does show a particular structure at a high level. When it comes to function, again, these weren't all taken from the same specification necessarily, as I recall, uh, different types of flow diagram. Uh, there's a very simple linear flow diagram, uh, but it should be made uh, 
as a, as a description of what the computer does and not what the user does. So it's a function of what the computer is doing. And on the left hand side, that is a little bit more high level uh, at a functional level, but include them. In the claims, you should always ensure that you claim physical products. I, I'm amazed over the years that I find claims to some interesting things, such as a lookup table. I've had a claim to a stack or a heap. Um, uh, what is a stack or a heap? It is a, a concept that, that uh, is executed within a program. Similarly, a lookup table is a set of data. But again, it is uh, a, um, not something physical. It will be in physical form when it's on a product, um, such as a medium, but not in the, those terms. So claim something real and tangible. Um, of course, you've got clients and servers, you've got a transmitter, a receiver, a plug and a socket. Sometimes there are uh, components in a system which require uh, two ends, client and server. And in that case, there is a justification in some cases for claiming having more than one independent claim to each part. So you can try to enforce the patent for infringement by a single uh, infringer in a single country. So no multi-party infringement, no contributory infringement. You want to be able to enforce as far as possible against a single entity in a single country. You need to be able to claim the client apparatus, the client method, a client computer system, then you need to claim the server apparatus, the server method, and the server could be a program. Um, and sometimes even the EPO examiners need a little gentle persuasion, but they will accept them. It does become challenging when you have a limited number of claims, but uh, ideally you want to, to cover all of those elements. A uh, useful shorthand. This is for Europe, but it is something that is worth bearing in mind because we're talking about putting things into the specification, which is helpful from the outset. Um, it doesn't cause a harm in the US or other countries. A useful shorthand for a medium, um, for example, is a carry medium, carrying computer readable code, which when executed by a processor or a computer, causes the computer to carry out the method of any of that lot that I've described before. Now, of course, using a term like a carrier medium or a machine readable medium um, covers potentially non statutory transitory media. Now, that's a problem in the US. Indeed, I've had a couple of objections from US examiners. Um, but if the specification describes that a uh, carrier media or a machine readable media uh, is a class of media in which sits transitory media and non-transitory media, you can then limit down to transitory media by disclaiming and surrendering uh, the non-statutory subject matter to men down. So um, that doesn't hurt you in the US, in my opinion. Um, another tip for the US, is, uh, sorry, for Europe, uh, is you can do this for system claims as well. Um, if you draft a set of method claims, and you think, oh, golly, I've only got a few claims left. Uh, otherwise, my claims fees are going to be huge. Uh, you can simply refer to a system for processing data or doing whatever it does, comprising at least one processor and a storage medium, storing process with implementable code, which when executed by at least one processor, causes the processor, causes, sorry, causes the system to carry out method. Bang, one claim, and you get everything again. Uh, I use this a lot in Europe to save claims fees. So it's a useful trick um, to include it so that when you come to Europe, and of course I am looking very much at Europe, but it provides the basis you need because of our strict requirements on amendments. <coughs> so that's a summary really of what, what some thoughts on drafting global PAPA specification. Um, and I'm sure hopefully there'll be some questions. Let's move on a little bit. So once you've drafted one, what do you do with it? Um, I want to just throw some thoughts on global filing strategy or strategies. There isn't such thing as one, but talking about, so, okay, you've drafted this specification and your client is really truly interested in potentially more, uh, more you know, globally more than one country outside the US typically. 
there are a number of ways to look at things. Um, let's take a look at the US focused strategy, number one, should we call it? Taking the typical approach, finally US provisional. I would urge that you actually try as best as possible to file a provisional as a full utility patent specification, even if you use it, file it as a provisional. The benefit of filing that is that you can include um, European style claims, US claims, of course, a provisional doesn't incur any claims fees, so you can throw everything in, not worry about claims. There are no claims fees. Uh, you get 21 year patent term, as long as you're not in a hurry. Uh, there is a delay, of course, in the system by using that provisional. So at the priority deadline, you can then file a US full utility application by amending the provisional and file a PCT application, if you wish, separately with the specification bifurcated um, to suit US specific practice and international non-US practice um, from that initial uh, provisional uh, specification. So that's one thought. Taking another look, you could, uh, again, US focused, you could file a PCT application at USPTO first off. Now, that's pretty unusual. Uh, it puts the fees quite high at the beginning, of course. In doing that, you'd include uh, a European style set of claims, potentially, or US claims. It depends on who do you want to do the searching. If you want the European Parliament to be the International Search Authority, they're going to search the first set of claims they see, uh, and they're going to apply European standards against them. So ideally, if you're filing a PCT, you should bear in mind, and using the EPO as the search authority, bear in mind the EPO uh, search and um, opinion that's going to issue. Um, no claims fees are payable on PCTs, of course. That's one of the benefits of the PCT system. You're only going to get a 20-year term. Um, uh, but again, uh, and again, the US patent is delayed because, of course, if you're filing and not taking it into the US system, you're going to have to wait. Well, you can wait as long as you want for the 30-month term. Um, at national phase, yeah, you can then make the necessary amendments in the US to reduce the claims and avoid uh, the subject matter that you don't need. Um, and for the EPO, you can do the same thing. You can remove, you can delete the material you no longer need. Uh, it's not caused you any problem, but you just don't need it anymore. That's strategy, the second way of approaching things. A third approach, um, file the full US patent specification at the beginning. Of course, you're now limited by claims, so you need to use the US claims, uh, but you can include the text of European claims in the description at the end um, and provide basis for multiple dependencies and even some means for function language at the back of the specification uh, so that you have full support for a European application. Uh, the benefit of that, you get a full 20 year, you get, oh, sorry, you only get the 20 year term, but the US is not delayed. You're, you're straight in there with uh, the US processing. At the end of the priority deadline, you can then file a PCT application or indeed avoid the PCT system and go straight to national applications by amending the claims to replace the US claims with the European claims. Um, for example, I think of Europe, but it could be whatever. Uh, you could, you've got the basis in, the, in that US application for the type of format of the claims that you want in other countries. I've put in here a European focus strategy, just as something different to look at. If the client really has a, a key uh, need uh, looking at Europe, <coughs> you could file a full EPO application or indeed a national application at uh, the UK, Germany, France, wherever. Uh, generally, Germany or UK are the typical targets that you might go for. Benefit of the UK, of course, is no translations uh, and very low fees. But you file the application in, in the EPO or US first, using the European claims first, uh, because obviously they're going to be reviewed and examined and searched in accordance with European practice. And you can put the US claims again either at the end of the claims or uh, in the specification. If you're filing the EPO, you've got claims fees to worry about. If you're filing in the UK, UK IPO, for example, well, there are claims fees, but they're negligible. So you don't have to worry about those. 21 year patent term now for the US. 
Um, but, the, but the US pattern is delayed that way too, either because you go nationally from the European or via a PCT or whichever way you go. So at the priority deadline, you can file the US application by amending the claims, reducing the dependencies to suit US practice and or file a PCT application um, for, for other countries. And again, you could just delay further in the US using the PCT system. Uh, and delay the amendments of the claims until the national phase. <coughs> so an international focus strategy, um, sort of summarize all strategies. File an EPA or national application or a PCT. You could also simultaneously file in the US. And so you're using the same specification, but now what you do is you just slightly recast them for their own uh, uh, style requirements of each particular country. Um, and these could be filed simultaneously or nearly simultaneously. And that, if they're filed simultaneously, then there's no worry about uh, priority, which one needs to support the other. Of course, the benefit, there are benefits to this, and I have done this before for clients, is that you try to separate US uh, file wrapper from the file wrapper in the rest of the world, because it's argued they are, they're different they didn't start, they don't have the same priority date. It allows the specifications to be tailored. Um, so avoid finding, you know, they can be completely separate. And it avoids means for function claim, uh, mean, meaning, or any other potential leakage of file wrapper estoppel. It avoids the delays in the US. And of course, if you have a separate PCT application, if you wish to, you could of course still use that to enter the US um, national phase 30 months later and sort of spring out of that one. But the danger of that is you, you've then sort of entered the US and, and broken that uh, natural barrier between uh, the foreign content and the US content. But that's an alternative thought process on the filing strategy. General filing issues. Um, general strategy issues here. I wanted to put this just at the end. Uh, you know, my view is always that you should look to protect the countries. Where do you file patents? It should be in your markets rather than manufacturing centers. Now, if you block the markets, you block importation of the manufactured pro uh, products, particularly when you have customs assistance, as you do in many countries. Um, but when you have a very key known manufacturing center or manufacturing uh, competitor, yes, of course, it may be more uh, effective to go uh, to look for patent protection in that country. The issues you need to consider, of course, are cost versus value. Do you, do you file? That goes without saying, really, why, why bother filing? What's the cost? What's the potential benefit? What's the relationship between the patented product and the business? How core is it to the business? What are you, what are you trying to do with this patent? What's the purpose? I mean, there are many reasons for filing a patent application. Uh, protective, it could be improving market position. It could be actually slightly more aggressively significant to a competitor's business. It could be a defensive position. And of course, you could be looking for licensing revenue. Uh, foreign and filing strategy needs to comply with the business's overall IP strategy. And the final thing, of course, you must always consider is the patentability enforcement standards in the country. So first of all, is this subject matter protectable, which is of course always an issue when it comes to software and business method patents. And uh, when it comes to enforce enforceability, you know, uh, is this patent uh, really, does it have any value? Because if everybody knows you just can't pursue patent protection um, by way of enforcement, then it does devalue um, the patent in that country. Um, looking then again at general filing strategy issues, I just wanted to throw up that there are many routes to file for filing foreign patents. We're used to the Paris, Paris Convention, that's simply the means by which we claim priority. And there are several groupings of patent, uh, foreign patents. You have the PCT again with, you know, far more familiar with that, the European Patent Office, the central granting process for Europe. Africa has a similar process. Um, Eurasia has a similar process and the Gulf has a similar, a similar process, similar system. So a number, number of groupings there to remember. Um, 
Another issue with regard to strategy is urgency, timing. Where do you file? You need to look at the costs and timing. Deferral delays, uh, sorry, deferral delays the costs, enables more information about products. So you can uh, use the PCT, uh, it'll delay costs, it'll give you more time to, to determine whether you really want to go ahead in certain countries, but it does slow the granting process down. So that's the trade-off. Um, you may need granted patents for licensing or import and enforcement purposes. So the speed, speed versus cost, these all need to be weighed up. When it comes to the European Patent Office, of course, this is um, something which has been a major problem, uh, the speed in the EPO over, over time. Uh, it takes, it, the EPO has speed up considerably, but they are still quite slow. And they have front-loaded the system now, so that does potentially speed things up by issuing an initial opinion. But if you do go into the full stage of examination after the search opinion, uh, you can still be in the examination in five, seven, ten years or longer. Uh, they are removing some of the old delays, but I am currently dealing with a case. I've got all proceedings next month on, which is 18 years old. Uh, so it's there is an issue with speed, and. Sometimes national filings may suit you better with regard to speed and cost and looking at your targeted filing strategy. So, okay, last topic, let's talk about other traps, the, the, the danger issues. So hopefully some practical thoughts here. Um, US practice allows continuations and continuation parts. Uh, these are really dangerous unless you take care because of course, you can lose the priority claim. A European application, or sorry, a Paris Convention requires a foreign application, such as Europe, to be filed within 12 months of the first application to the invention anywhere in the world. So the first filing date starts that. The continuation doesn't allow you to regain that 12 month period. Um, and what, when the earlier application publishes, that acts as prior not against you. So you can, you can actually shoot yourself in the foot by trying to file a late priority. <clears throat> application. A continuation in part is a different beast. Uh, there can be significant material in a continuation, which a continuation part, which may arguably be a new invention, and therefore there may be a basis for a claim to priority for that new subject matter. But it's only the new subject matter which has a basis for being um, the new invention and set the clock again. Uh, so another, other issues and problems are uh, reliance on provisional. Again, I'm going to hammer on that point again. Provisional specifications, the strict basis for priority, almost literal wording is required. And if there is an intervening disclosure by the applicant after the priority date, but before the filing date, you can invalidate, the applicant can validate the patent uh, by their own disclosure. That's, also, that's an issue. Um, reliance on the amendment. This is under the same, on the same slide, but the same problem. Strict basis for amendments later on. Um, we often get asked, can you make this amendment? Um, and we have to find the wording in the specification. Uh, we're not allowed to pick and choose between embodiments. We have to find a very clear uh, disclosure which sits in one place and not scattered across the specification for the amendments. John? Uh, I'd like to interrupt real quick, just because we do have a number of questions, and uh, we're uh, we're about five minutes from from the end of our time, a lot of time. So I have just two slides. Let me just quickly put this one. Yeah, sure. Two seconds. Perfect. I literally come just it's literally two slides. But I say, yeah, novelty, EPO considerations, grace period. Uh, we don't have one. Confidential secret prior use, not prior art. There's no grace period. Yeah, beware of your own disclosures. Last but one slide. Patentable subject matter, already talked about that. What I haven't mentioned is surgery or therapeutical methods, not patentable in Europe. Be careful, that's another area of subject matter. Um, patentability to be wary of. And summary, which is what I'll get to. Strategy, depending on the focus. Uh, strategy one has some advantages. Um, you know, horses for courses. Um, first application must be good and uh, recommended that you have some help from foreign attorneys to, to get you through that. But beware the traps. And if you really want to go into it in some detail, uh, there is a full detail. Uh, this subject matter has been gone through in great detail in a book chapter that is uh, published by BNA. 
So thank you. Yes, I knew I'd be pushing for time. So please, Greg, <laughs> hope you got some questions. Uh, excellent. Well, thank you, John. That was super informative. And I think uh, the number of questions indicate there's a lot of interest. So um, we'll jump right in. So we have a, a question from, um, from Bernie Greenspan. Uh, he's had some experience where use of examples in the U.S. to house experimental results has raised objections in the EPO with reference to those data to support a claim. Uh, he's looking for comments uh, on your experience with something with anything like that. Examples. Uh, I presume we're talking about numbered examples that look like claims. Um, it's hard to it's hard to quite understand what the problems were. I've never seen uh, seen a problem with that if, if there is a an explicit claim type language used and just simply replace the word claim with examples. Um, they, they, they literally support what you're looking for. Uh, this may come through from using the word examples in a different way, maybe in a different technical field. I'm not quite sure. Maybe you can Someone uh, who, who was that could spring, spring back with a clarifying question. I'll come back to that towards the end if I get time. I'm sure. Not why there should be objections to that. So next one, um, does the EPO permit single element means claims? Uh, yes, if you, I, I gave an example in there um, where you can simply refer back to means for performing the method. Yes, is the answer. Um, I have had that allowed. Um, and if all the technical features are recited in the method, then simply means for performing the method uh, is allowable. But again, you can't suddenly introduce that later on. If the wording wasn't used in the specifications filed, the examiner may say that's an overgeneralization. The only means you had before was a processor and a computer. Now, maybe you've got some quantum thing that I don't know about that you're now covering by any means. So yes, potentially, but again, it has to be, that language would need to be in the specification at the beginning. So a system comprising means for performing the method of anyone who claims one to 20, I have had allowed. Yes. Okay, so um, next question. There are requirements for technical, or are the requirements for technical effect less stringent in national filings in Europe compared to EPO examination? Okay, I'm going to pick on just the two, the big, well, the big three, France, Germany, this is, this is the topic of a separate presentation, but unfortunately the UK, um, I can only say is the toughest and very difficult to get software patents allowed in the UK. Um, unfortunately, you end up going around in a sort of catch-22 situation, they just say it's just software. Germany um, is a lot more lenient. Uh, only in that they don't discount all the non-technical features. They do look at the whole of the invention. Um, so they don't throw away the non-technical features. They give you a better reading of your claim. Um, and France, well, France is a bit of a lottery. Uh, they traditionally don't have an inventive step test. So um, it's a registration country. And therefore, um, yeah, litigate there and find out. <laughs> it's, it's really interesting. There's decisions going both ways. Uh, there as to which way uh, there have been some very lenient decisions on technical subject matter, um, but there's also been some harder ones. So it's uh, rather hit and miss. So you've got three three different areas you know, ends there. The UK very difficult. The US, Germany a lot better, and France is a bit of a mix mixed bag. Great. Great. So Bernie did provide a little bit of a um, additional color for his examples question. Okay. In, in life sciences, experimental data can be reported under a heading of examples. Uh, okay. EPO yeah. examiners appear to dislike referring to results in those ex experiments as support for claims and amendments. Yeah. No, I thought that's where you might be going. Yeah, that's a different, that's the problem with the use of the word examples. Yeah. Examples in the life science field are uh, purely sort of uh, the results, are the, yeah, the experimental results field. Um, I'm talking about using examples as meaning just a different need for the word embodiment or, or claim. So, um, yeah, we are talking about somewhat different things there. And yes, in life science, if you're trying to rely on examples, the subject matter from, from your experimental results, basically, to support amendments, uh, you can get into difficulties of support, particularly when you are trying to extract features. Again, you're picking, cherry picking a particular feature from that example uh, to support a, a, a sort of an intermediate position from the breadth of the claim 
to, should we say, the full details of that experimental result or, or the um, particular formulation or equipment was used for that experimentation result. Uh, so that can cause you a problem, yeah. So let me make it quite clear. When I use the word examples, I'm talking about just using that as a word, another word for an embodiment um, to, to avoid the word claim. Because if you use the word claim so in the description, the examiner's going to start, or the EPA will start charging you money. Um, so don't list a, a numbered set of things at the end of the description and use the word claim. Just use another word. Um, and I use the word example. Apologies for life science, because that does cause some confusion. Great. Hey, I'm going to let uh, Pete Palmer has a question. Oh, he's still on the line. Pete, you're on mute. Hi, Pete, you there? I can see you're on the system, but uh, your microphone's muted. I don't know whether you're allowed to speak on the system or how it works. All right, well, let's see if, if Pete figures that out. We'll, uh, we'll come back to him, but... Uh, so how do um, EPO examiners handle claims to multiple provisional applications in, uh, in a priority chain? Uh, that, that's tricky and very messy. I'm afraid often the end result of that is it, it ends in tears, as they say, um, because if you are relying on multiple provisional applications and they are separate applications, you, you, you can't pick. It's the same as from embodiments in an amendment. You can't cherry pick pieces from different priority documents and say, ah, but if you take that bit from there and that bit from there, look, I can make this. You know, that's, that's where my basis is. The examiner will say, yeah, but you didn't teach that those, those came together. They don't, they're not directly and unambiguously derivable from the same teaching. Um, so yeah, unfortunately, uh, multiple priority claims are an indication of a weak priority claim, potentially. Well, great. Well, so John, thank you very much. We've actually gone over our time. Um, we will um, try to address the additional questions that we didn't get to, that there are a couple uh, couple requested clarifications. Um, we'll, we'll try to get back to those people with, with answers here um, in the near future, but uh, we appreciate everybody for, for attending. Um, you know, please um, refer back to SLW Institute uh, the website. We will be posting the presentation um, and a recording of, of it as well in, in case you would like to uh, look at it sometime in the future. Okay, well, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.